That stays in there. Hello. What happens in game room stays in game room. Yes. <laughs> okay, we're going to... Oh, we had initially went through part of Psalms, but then it was like such a slow go, and we ended up with so much time off that I figured I'd just go ahead and do a complete study of it in one study. And so, do you have your pen? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, everybody welcome, and we'll get started. So, I've got Psalms 23 on uh, on your page, on the blank. Does somebody want to read it? Ryan? <laughs> okay. <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Uh, thou preparest a table for me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. I feel like I don't have an amen on the end of it. Um, so, and we talked about this before uh, early on, but the quality of life that a sheep had was entirely dependent upon the shepherd, the owner. So, uh, there could be a good shepherd that would make sure that they were fed and watered and uh, taken well care of, or there would be, uh, there were some that didn't care anything about them, and it just let them get all sickly and uh, let them starve and be thirsty, you know, just all the opposite things. So, um, so their life was just dependent on whether they had a good shepherd or not. So, and I gave y'all a blank, like right early on in, but it says one of the reasons we are referred to as sheep is because sheep require more care and attention than any other livestock. So we're needy. We're needy. Yeah, we are. And so um, the good shepherd makes sure that all their needs are met. And um, the behavior as like their care and attention, just like we are, <laughs> you know, that... Uh, our behavior in sheep is, is similar in ways, a lot of ways. We have our fears and timidity, our stubbornness and stupidity, and we have our bad habits, you know, and all these things just like they do. And then also, a sheep a sheep has to purchase his sheep. A uh, shepherd has to purchase his sheep, you know, with his own hard-earned money, and so he pays a price for them to belong to him. And, of course, that's a parallel that Jesus paid a price for us, you know, and the shepherd is willing to lay down his life to protect his sheep and to take care of his sheep. And so, you know, Jesus laid down his life for us. Uh, he purchased us, and, uh, and so we belong to him. And then I uh, wrote down some verses in John about Jesus as the good shepherd. So you can see the comparisons. Uh, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gate, gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow. But they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they didn't understand what he was saying to them. So he tried again. <laughs> and he said, um, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, 
who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. You know, a lot of times um, the, sh the shepherd, uh, like if the sheep were kept in a pen overnight, he would lay in the gateway uh, for them or the mouth of the pen to keep them from wandering out wandering off anywhere and also to keep predators from coming in so he literally would just uh, lay there for their protection and then um, here's another blank <clears throat> other livestock like cows and horses have to be driven but sheep follow their shepherd so I thought that was interesting, another comparison, you yeah. know, because we're supposed to follow Christ. But um, sometimes the, like, there would be, you know, because there wasn't necessarily always just one shepherd out there. There might be several and have all of their uh, sheep out there gaze, gazing. Gazing. <laughs> gazing sheep. Maybe <laughs> <Let me> stargazing. <laughs> yeah, gazing. They'd uh, all be out there uh, grazing <laughs> in uh, different areas, but the sheep were, like, all together. And so then whenever uh, the shepherd wanted to get his sheep, he would go and he would call them and his sheep were the only ones that would respond to him because they knew his voice. So anybody else could come out there and start calling sheep, but they didn't respond to anybody except their own shepherd. Cool? You know, so yeah. So uh, that's when he, when he's talking about my sheep know my voice and a stranger they won't follow, you know, that's what it's talking about. Um, a shepherd also, we talked about this before because y'all thought it was kind of gross, but puts his mark on the sheep. You know, he'll, uh, he will, uh, when he purchases a new sheep, he has a distinctive earmark that, uh, where he'll cut it into one of the sheep's ears. And so with that earmark, even from a distance, it's easy for him to identify his sheep. And then we talked about how that, uh, back in the biblical days when there was a, a Hebrew slave um, that, you know, he had earned his freedom or whatever, but he wanted to stay on with that family, the master of the house would put his ear against the door frame and put a mark, marking him as a member of that household forever, you know, and stuff. So once that we, and we receive, when we receive Christ, then we receive his mark you know, the mark of the cross on our lives where that we forever belong to Jesus. You know, so, uh, so we're his. Um, the I shall not want means that nothing is lacking and that the sheep are utterly contented with, uh, with the shepherd's care. Uh, they're not hungry. They're not thirsty. They don't need anything. And um, so even in hardship they uh, wouldn't lack the expert care management of their master. They're always taken care of. So the good shepherd is the owner uh, of his flock. And to him, he loves, you know, the, the good shepherd that cares about his sheep, loves seeing his uh, sheep contented and happy and well-fed and stuff So under, under his care. And uh, he gives, you know, that's his life is tending to his sheep and taking care of them and making sure that their needs are all met. So uh, he'll, he'll spare himself no pains to provide shelter from storms, protection from ruthless enemies and diseases and parasites, you know, that can get on the sheep. He tries to take care of all of that. He goes out every morning to look out over his flock and he checks them over to make sure each one of them is okay and he keeps a close eye on them all day long he's watching over them and and even when he's sleeping at night he kind of sleeps with one eye open you know trying to make sure that they don't run into any kind of danger that there's no predators or anything that get after them when they're sleeping so um and then it says uh he makes he makes me to lie down in green pastures and this i thought was really interesting because it's uh it's, it says it's almost impossible for a sheep to be made to lie down unless there's several requirements that are met. Uh, they're very timid, so they refuse to lie down unless they're free from all fear, you know. And um, and they also there's a lot of 
we talked about before the social behavior in the flock, you know, uh, that they wouldn't lie down unless they were free from having any friction with any other sheep, you know, because we were talking about how that another sheep might decide they wanted their spot, you know, and they're over there trying to make them move and, and picking on them basically and stuff, you know, so they couldn't lay down and relax when they had that kind of stuff going on. And then they also, uh, there would be times, uh, I think it was summertime, that they're bothered by flies and parasites and they won't lay down because they can't relax because they got pests pestering them. <laughs> and, um, and then they won't lie down if they're hungry, you know, and or thirsty or anything, you know. So uh, all these things have to be taken care of before they'll lie down in green pastures. And then there's a, a blank that says there must be a definite sense of freedom from fear, tension, aggravations, and hunger for a sheep to be able to lie down. And so the only person that can take care of all of those things for them is their shepherd. You know, so, um, and then and then if, they're, if they are restless and not able to lay down and stuff, well then uh, everything or nothing bodes well for them. You know, it's just all downhill from there. So, and uh, sheep are, since they are timid, they're very uh, easily um, excited or frightened. And so, uh, like a, one of the things he said was that even a, a jackrabbit or something startling, a couple of them could start a whole stampede with the sheep. And that uh, uh, ewes, the pregnant ewes, if they had, uh, if they got caught up in a stampede and running like that, it could cause them to lose their babies and stuff. You know, it's just not a good deal. And then there was also, they had, uh, some of the predators were dogs, coyotes, cougars, bears, you know, just uh, several different kinds of enemies that would come after them. And, and of course, you know, sheep don't have any means of self-defense, and so all they know to do is run. You know, so, uh, I mean, every, you know, you might have a ram that has horns, but typically they're just going to run and freak out. <laughs> um but when their shepherd was there with them, you know, they were a lot less likely to freak out or be frightened or anything because they knew that he was there and that he was there to protect them and take care of them. So it gave them more peace. Um, the, I mentioned the friction between the flock. You know, because if they're having um, issues with other sheep and somebody's picking on them and not going to let them rest and stuff, then they end up having to stand up and defend themselves against, you know, the other sheep and maybe contest the their challenger and all this. And so, and, and like I said, a lot of times it might just be over the space that they're wanting to lay in, you know, something as simple as that. And so there was continual conflict and jealousy, you know, among sheep and the flocks. And, uh, so they get edgy, discontented, restless, and become irritable. 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 Well, less. <laughs> but the funny thing was is that like when they're going through all this stuff and they're having these issues, the minute the shepherd comes into view, it's like everything all stops. You know, the one that's picking on them stops picking on them. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the they just stop all their fighting. So the shepherd's presence makes this huge difference just in their behavior. And, um, and they're, so when their eye was on the shepherd and not on those around them, they entered a place of peace. So uh, this is something I think that I mentioned to Ryan a while back, you know, about that discussion is, is just remembering if our eyes are on the Savior instead of the issues that we have you know that we can have peace you know as opposed to all the other things um sheep in the summertime they uh would have issues with nasal flies bot flies warble flies <laughs> and ticks but uh, and so that was another reason why they couldn't lay down and rest because they were having all these issues with that. And so they're like shaking their heads and stomping the ground and running into the brush, you know, all these things trying to get these 
pests off of them. And so it's up to the shepherd to try to uh, take care of them and get rid of these issues for them. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that the shepherd has to do for his sheep to help them to be contented and ready to lay down and, and rest. Um, a lot of the land, especially in the area of the Middle East, was and is dry and brown and barren. So uh, the shepherds would actually cultivate their land to try to uh, have it where it would produce more grass and stuff for them and um, so that they would have something to eat and to help them to be able to be satisfied and be able to rest. And then uh, he leads me besides the still waters. The shepherd would know you know, because he'd scope out, he'd check everything out, and he always knew where the best uh, drinking places were. And then this is a blank. Generally, the water for the sheep came from three main sources. Dew on the grass, deep wells, or springs and streams. So he would always go to a lot of trouble to find a, uh, the places for them, the watering places, to be able to take them to. And uh, sometimes it was interesting because the morning would produce a lot of dew, you know, on the on the grass. And so sometimes he would get up early and lead them to areas where that they could eat the eat, drink the dew off the grass, or whether they eat the grass, they get the dew. And, um, and if the weather wasn't real hot where that it didn't uh, dry up or whatever, that they could actually uh, survive for months just on that morning dew every day and not even having to worry so much about getting it anywhere else. So, you know, not enough water for anybody, but for them would cause them to be uh, weak and impoverished. And, and then they would get restless. And when they were thirsty and... Uh, and didn't have water there for them, they would get restless and go in search of water. And so sometimes when they'd go in search of water, what they would find would be potholes that had gross, disgusting water in it, and they would drink it, and then they would end up getting parasites, and it would make them sick and stuff, and they could even die from it, from the polluted water. So um, there was no substitute for them besides what the shepherd led them to to provide them with, to sustain them, and, uh, and which reminds me of the living water that we get, you know, from, from heaven, from the Lord. Uh, sometimes, sometimes we try to drink from potholes, <laughs> <laughs> and which uh, leads to spiritual parasites, and um, like venom, no, not really, but, uh, <laughs> and spiritual sickness. You know, when we could be drinking the living water, you know, from uh, from the well that never runs dry. But so it's just really important that we let our shepherd be the one to lead us to the water and to basically follow him and what his will is for us because he's leading us where we need to go. You know, if we don't get ahead of him and get impatient and uh, try to do things on our own. And uh, I think uh, the sheep, um, this is another blank, the sheep are very timid, so streams could even startle them <laughs> easily. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whoa, did you hear that? But, uh, and so the shepherd sometimes would um, stack rocks for them, uh, you know, to slow the water down and create a little dam. Oh, I didn't. A little dam so that the water could be still. You know, he leads me beside the still waters so that they would be at peace to drink it and then he restores my soul you know uh, oh well and I gave you a whole other blank there's a term cast remember we talked about that mm -hmm. cast or cast down for sheep I'm giving the little quotes I'm just doing it down here where nobody can see it um, for which uh, which is an old English shepherd's term for a sheep that has turned over on its back and can't get up by itself um, you know the it might be just laying in a comfortable spot that's a little bit of an indention or something, and he lays down, he gets on his side, and then at some point his legs end up getting up a little bit where he can't get up out of his spot, you know, and then he'll flounder around, and the more he flounders, the more his feet are up and he can't get up. 
We all feel yeah. about <laughs> I flounder <laughs> around quite a bit. <laughs> I've fallen and can't get up. Now yeah, and yeah, and, and they don't have those life alert things <laughs> for the sheep. So. But um, the shepherd. <laughs> I, yeah, the shepherd is the life alert. Life alert. She says, yeah. But um, so they're at that point, they're left open to predators. They could either if the if the yeah. shepherd didn't come around. They could lay there and die because they can't ever get up from that spot, you know. And so they're either going to lay there and starve to death and die of uh, starvation and thirst, or they're going to get killed by some kind of predator. So their life depends on that shepherd coming and finding them and helping them to get back up off of the ground. So... Um, in that way, because oh, it says that, I think we talked about this before, that when they're in that position, not only is it like a vulnerable position for them, but it also the gases in their stomach and stuff, kind of like a horse, I guess. They get all these uh, gases in their intestines and stomach, and it cuts off their blood circulation to their extremities eventually, especially their legs. And so, like I said, it would be if they didn't find them in time. And then... Um, and, the, and it reminds me of the scripture, the shepherd would always go looking for the sheep that was missing, you know, because if they all came back and that one is not showing up and it, he has to go look for it and then he finds it in this vulnerable position. So basically he'll leave the 99 to search for that one lost sheep to restore it to the flock as well as to himself. And he's rescuing it. He's massaging its limbs so that it can return to the flock and restoring it to health and basically restoring its soul. So he's because he's saving his life. And then Psalms fifty six thirteen says, You have delivered me from death and my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before God in the light of life. That's my baby grand my baby granddaughter. <laughs> <laughs> if you're hearing noises in the background. Um he guides my paths in righteousness for his name's sake. You know, um try to later now. <laughs> and Sheep are creatures of habit. I guess, I mean, so are we. That's another comparison. It's the same, you know. And so if, if they're left to their own resources, they'll follow the same trails. They'll eat on the same grass. They'll do all the same stuff until uh, they totally destroy the ground, you know. They create ruts and in the ground and the, and then it ends up being they can they can continue to do it until it's beyond repair and that ground cannot ever even be used for grazing land again you know so um and then they'll i mean they'll just stay in their safe, favorite spots <laughs> don't we have our favorite spots mm -hmm. um until so there's nothing left but dirt and then it'll end up polluting their own ground until it's full of disease and parasites um they gnaw the grass to the ground until the roots are damaged and the grass won't come back. And the, the sheep owners that didn't care about their sheep would just allow that stuff to happen. You know, um, they, they didn't care. I mean, it wasn't their land, wasn't their... I mean, they just didn't care. So, in order for the sheep to flourish, they had to be under the shepherd's control and guidance. So, it had to be somebody that cared about them and, uh, and just as sheep will blindly, habitually, stupidly follow one another along the same little trails until they become ruts, we as humans cling to the same habits. You know, even though we might have seen them ruin other people's lives or whatever. The stubborn, self will proud, self-sufficient sheep that persists in pursuing its old paths and grazing on the old polluted ground will end up a bag of bones on ruined land. And, uh, you know, there's... And just like people, broken homes, broken hearts, you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, the greatest safeguard, another thing is, the, the greatest safeguard is for a sheep to keep on the move, for the shepherd to keep his sheep on the move, because uh, that way they're not in the same spot for too long, and they don't destroy their uh, grazing grounds and stuff. So they're shifted from pasture to pastures periodically to, so to prevent overgrazing and stuff like that and um, prevent the rutting of trails and erosion of the land and it also prevents infestation of the sheep from the internal parasites and diseases that come from when they do do that uh, he has a <laughs> the shepherd has 
a predetermined plan. They have it all figured out before they go out there. They know when they're going to rotate them, where they're going to move them to, and uh, and it also it also affects how he cares for the sheep. Also affects his reputation as a shepherd, you know, because uh, as opposed to someone who doesn't care. So he guides our paths to righteousness or in righteousness also for his namesake. Um, and then it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll feel no, I'll feel no evil. <laughs> I will fear no evil for you're with me. So in the summer months, the shepherd, um, he goes on long treks to the mountainous areas, to the high country, and um, he checks everything out and uh, takes his and that's after he's, because, you know, for the winter months, the other months, he stays at home. And he'll take them to different pastures and stuff, but it's in his home territory. But then uh, in the summer months, he takes them up to the high country. And uh, the summer is spent in close companionship. He, well, Since he is taking them out there away from the home, it's more of an intimate thing because it's just him and the sheep out there all the time. And... Um, they would go on long drives. So the sheep would move along slowly, feeding as they go, you know, event, you know, going towards their destination and uh, gradually working their way up the mountains behind the snow that's receding and everything. And by late summer, they're well up on the remote alpine mat meadows above the timber lines. And uh, the, toward the end of the year, as the fall passes, the sheep are driven home to the ranch headquarters where they spend the winter. But during this time, the flock is entirely alone with the shepherd. And David, as a shepherd, knew this routine because when Samuel was sent, you know, when Samuel um, was going to anoint the king and his brothers all came, and then he said, is there not somebody else? And he said, well, there's David, but he's out, whatever. And they had to send for him because he was off somewhere else tending the sheep so they had to uh, go go get him and uh, so he would have been up in the hills probably tending to his flock or his father's flock and um, but he knew about the first hand about the difficulties and dangers and the treks into high company <laughs> high country <laughs> you know I, I look at the word but that's not what I mean. <laughs> he knew the dangers of flooding avalanches rock slides I mean there's all these things poisonous plants, predators that would raid the flock, and storms of sleet and hail and snow. He was fully prepared to protect and safeguard his flock and tend them with skill under every circumstance. And David says, I will fear no evil for you are with me because the good shepherd was with him in every situation and every dark trial and every dilemma. And every mountain has its valleys and they had like deep ravines and stuff in them and um, the best uh, grazing and stuff would be to go through those valleys and uh, but the shepherd would lead his flock gently up those paths that wind through the dark valleys and the verse says even though i walk through the valley of the shadow of death uh you know because of all the predators all the things that could be there you know waiting for them but he led them through that and um and then what the author of this book said it it doesn't say anything about stopping there but to walk through the valley of the shadow of death because you know it's like pastor call always says if you're going through hell keep on going because mm -hmm. yeah, you'll come out of it also another reason they're taking to the mountaintops by way of the valleys is because it's usually a well watered route they could find refreshing water along the way from rivers strings spring <laughs> strings springs <laughs> and quiet pools and um, as Christians, we discover that it's in the valleys of our lives that we find refreshment from God. Usually it's in the, I, I can say for myself, that usually in the valleys of my life and when I'm going through crap is when I've always had the most spiritual growth. You know, so, um, so when we've walked with him through some troublesome times, we discover that we could find our refreshment in him in the middle of these tough times. You know, and I'm sure it's probably the same for you and the same for mm -hmm. all of us. You know, it's, you know, I don't like going through bad things, bad times and suffering from things, but it's definitely an opportunity for spiritual growth. And after that, we can relate 
to other people that are going through similar things and be a blessing to those that are that are going through it now and um and it's just it's good for us i think that's one reason why god lets us go through some of the things we go through is not only does it um, draw us closer to him spiritually but it helps us to be able to be uh more able to relate to other people that are going through the same thing and then we can't we can be more of a blessing and a help to them and it's uh, something that's important um, another reason to take the sheep through the valley to the mountaintop is that uh, I think I said that already but there's good foliage for them to graze on and they're not hurried partially because they're not familiar with that area and the shepherd wants to make sure that there's going to be water and grazing available ahead of them and uh, the shepherd keeps a watch for predators, like we said before, coyotes, bears, wolves, cougars, and um, that they might hide in the cliffs and stuff and be watching for them to come through. And so uh, he was always on the lookout. Also, there could be rock slides and mud slides and all these kind of things that could injure the sheep. So, uh, but he knows that this is the best way to take them. So he goes ahead and takes them that. So. It's comforting for us, for us to know that God is our source of strength and our protection, even in all the dark valleys, that he's taking care of us. Um, this is a blank. The uh, sheep didn't have to fear that predators would attack them or that they would go hungry or thirsty, even in the darkest valley, because their shepherd was always there with them to protect them. Therefore, they had no reason to fear any evil. So the word's evil. 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 Um, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. When the shepherd's out with his sheep, he can only, especially back then, you know, they would only have basically their rod and their staff. And I never really knew what the difference was or uh, anything. But, uh, and of course, modern shepherds, they carry a rifle and a, and a staff. You know, but there was a, there's a small knapsack that holds his lunch and water and a few first aid items is what they carry nowadays. Uh, in the Middle East, the shepherd carries only a rod and a staff, which is what they used to carry. Uh, the rod, this is a blank. The rod was for protection. It was shorter with a knob on the end, kind of like a, a club. And those were, they would... Uh, go into the brush and select uh, a young sapling you know a tree that they would uh, dig up from the ground and then the end of it that was closest to the ground that's bigger going down mm -hmm. into the roots they would smooth it out and round it off uh, and it would be made out of hard wood and it would be like a club basically for them you know for protection so uh, after he did that, he would spend, uh, he would practice with his club. He'd learn how to throw it, you know, to hit any kind of predator that was coming to him and stuff. Or he would also have it for a club if anything got close to him or his sheep. So this is another blank. The rod stood as a symbol of his strength, his power, his authority in any serious situation. The rod was what he relied on for protection for both himself and his flock when they were in danger. And it was also the instrument he used to discipline and correct any wayward sheep that insisted on wandering away. Like Mrs. Gadabout. You remember when we talked about Mrs. Gadabout? Mm -hmm. This is getting off okay. subject a little bit, but he had, uh, he had a sheep that she was a beautiful sheep she uh, she was very well proportioned. You know, she had beautiful markings on her eyes were pretty and <laughs> and all this stuff. But Mrs. Gadabout always thought the grass was greener on the other side of the fence. And so that's why he named her that. Just because she was always getting out. And uh, not only did, and she became a pro at getting out and running off. And he was always having to go get her and bring her back. And then she was such a pro that she started teaching the other sheep how to get out and run off. And so they were all getting out, or not all of them, but her and her little bunch oh, that yeah. she had taught that. So Mrs. Gadabout eventually ended up being Miss Hamchop. Ham Lamb Lamb Chop. Miss Hamchop. Lamb Chop. 
Anyway, so yeah, yeah. So this is get about didn't get about anymore. <laughs> So, yeah. as far as she could. and it's an example to us about people who are like always, you know, you're following the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're following the Lord and then you decide you want to go this way, you know, and everything, the grass looks greener over here. And so you're just always back and forth, back and forth and back and forth and can't ever. And then if you're causing other people to be misled yeah. and follow you the wrong way, then you might end up like you get about it. But I found that story very interesting. The sheep looks at the shepherd's rod, his weapon of power, authority, and defense as a constant comfort because that's how the shepherd is able, able to control me not speak English. <laughs> Every situation. It was through Moses' rod that miracles were made manifest, not only to convince Pharaoh, but also to reassure the people of Israel. It reminds me of this thing I read the other day about, um, or if you can't think of a word, say, I can't think of what that is in English. <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> you can remember another one? <laughs> yeah. Well, that way it make people think that maybe you were bilingual. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. How you say, uh... <laughs> how do you say that in English? However, uh, I'm not even single legal. <laughs> I think it would be like uni legal. <laughs> uni legal. <laughs> I barely speak anything except jumble, mumble, jumble. So, <laughs> but the rod, the rod speaks of the spoken word, the expressed intent, and the intent, extended activity of God's mind and will in dealing with men. And it implies his authority of divinity. And the scriptures are the rod and are the extension of his mind and will and intentions to mortal man. So we know what he wants us to do. He know, we know what he needs us to do. We know how we're protected, you know, in all these things by following the word, you know, and, and the good shepherd. Um, when a sheep kept wandering off and heading for trouble... Uh, the shepherd sometimes would toss his rod at him to get his attention and cause him to come scurrying back to the fold. He would also use his rod to examine and count the sheep. But because of their long wool, it isn't always easy to detect or for them to tell if they had any diseases or anything on them, their skin, because it was so covered up and uh, or even any wounds or anything. And so uh, they would take the rod and part their wool to check the condition of their skin and everything and the, and also the cleanliness of their fleece and uh, and also you know make sure they didn't have any wounds check the conformation conformation of their body and uh, he also like he would open this, the fleece and then uh, run his hands through there and start to feel for any abnormalities Abnormalities. <laughs> Abnormalities. Abnormalities. <laughs> Abnormalities. <laughs> I made a new word. Versus a normal C. <laughs> or D or E. <laughs> and uh, just to make sure that everything was well with them. And uh, that was also a comfort to them because they basically understood that he's looking for, that he's checking them over to make sure that they're okay. So if we submit to God and his word, then he will search us search me and know me you know all this stuff so that <laughs> there we can't pull the wool over his eyes <laughs> oh, har, har, har. Har. <laughs> but yeah <laughs> so uh also he gets with that he can get below the surface and find out anything that need to be exposed in our hearts and stuff um blank wool in the scripture speaks of self-life self-will self-assertion and self-pride and so god has to get below all of that to do the work in our wills to right the <laughs> right the ring <laughs> right the wrongs that are uh, often beneath our surface uh, the skilled shepherd uses his rod to drive off predators like we've already said and uh, often uh, it would be like if there's snakes in the bushes and the brush and stuff he beat the brush with his rod to 
chase them off and stuff, and also to keep other uh, critters from disturbing the flock. The staff, more than any other uh, item, identifies the shepherd as a shepherd. Uh, nobody in any other profession carries a shepherd staff, which would make sense. Um, it's uniquely an instrument used for the care and management of the sheep, and only the sheep. It's designed, shaped, and adapted especially to the needs of sheep, and is used only for their benefit. And here's a blank. <laughs> the staff is essentially a symbol of the concern and the compassion that a shepherd has for his sheep. You know, the other one, the rod was uh, also for discipline and all that kind of stuff, but this is showing his compassion and his concern that he has for them and for the comfort of the sheep. Um, it was, uh, what was I going to say? The shepherd's staff is normally a long slender stick, often with a crook on one end. It's shaped, smoothed, and cut to the best to suit the shepherd's own personal use. And just as the rod of God is emblematic of the word of God, so the staff of God is symbolic of the spirit of God. And in Jesus' dealings with us as individuals, there's the sweetness, the comfort, the consolation, and gentle correction brought by the work of his gracious spirit. And the first role of the staff is just drawing the sheep together uh, in an intimate relationship. He'll, uh, he'll gently lift a newborn lamb and bring it to its mother if they become separated because he doesn't want the, you to reject your baby because his scent mm. is honor him. <laughs> and so, you know, he would draw it in that way. And then uh, it's also used to reach out and catch individual sheep and draw them close to himself to examine them. He's like, hey, come here. <laughs> Let me check you over. And um, also it was a useful way for shy, timid sheep that would want to keep the distance from the shepherd but he would would he just gently draw them in closer to him where that they would have to get used to being uh, personal and close with him uh, the blank is the staff is also used for guiding the sheep he guides them gently into a new path or through a gate or through dangerous or difficult routes by laying the stick gently against them he, you know, if he wants them to go this way, he puts the staff over here on this way and kind of pushes them a little bit that way, you know, just using it uh, to guide them and uh, make sure that they're staying on the right path. Um, sometimes just out of a, something of intimacy, he would, like if he has a favorite sheep, he might, when he's walking along, just kind of put the staff up against him as they walk along as just a, gef a gesture gesture of affection and um, and it was always something that would make the sheep uh, it would make them realize that they're being comforted in a certain way, a deeper way so uh, his spirit guides us and leads us into all the truth and he gently, tenderly and persistently tells us this is the way guiding us a certain, you know, on the right path you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The sheep, you know, we're talking about the high uh, mountain ranges, high mountain country, and the summer ranges. And um, these are these are known as Alps, but they're known as tablelands. Uh, that uh, some some of them that are really sought out or sought after by shepherds. Um, and some of the finest sheep country in the world, the high plateaus of the sheep ranges are always referred to as mesas, which is a Spanish word for tables. So it may be seen that what David referred to as a table was actually the entire high summer range. You prepared a table before me. Though these uh, mesas may have been remote and hard to reach, the shepherd takes the time and trouble to make them ready for the arrival of his flocks. Even before the snow is melted, he'll make preliminary trips. Remember we talked about him going and checking everything out ahead of time. He'll look it over for its best use for his flock during the coming season. And before the sheep arrive, he'll make another trip or two just to prepare, prepare the table land for them. He takes a supply of salt and minerals to be distributed over the range as strategic spots for the benefit <laughs> <laughs> of the feet. 
during the summer. Uh, he decides ahead of time where his camps will be so that the sheep will have the best uh, bedding grounds. He decides which areas have the best grass. He decides which areas could only be grazed lightly, which ones can be grazed more heavily. I mean, there's just a lot of thought and time and uh, work that goes into that. He also looks for uh, poisonous weeds that, um, that are out there to get rid of them or to uh, know where they are, where he can have his sheep avoid them. You know, because uh, if they ate them, there were some of the there's some of the weeds and stuff that were actually poisonous, but they were attractive to the sheep. You know, but if they ate them, it can make them sick and die. So he spent a lot of time just plucking up some of those weeds and stuff to try to keep them from getting eaten. So Jesus, our good shepherd, goes before us in every situation, anticipating the dangers that we might encounter, and uh, praying for us that we won't to come. We won't end up eating that poisonous thing or getting something we're not supposed to. And he's always keeping an eye out for predators that will hide and attack the sheep when least expected. And um, and they can get in to attack the sheep and disappear before even getting caught. So the shepherd has to be always watching. Well, you know, because I mean, I imagine they can be pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the shepherd also seeks out springs and drinking uh, places for his sheep. Uh, like I mentioned before, he might make little uh, dams to hold water and he'll open uh, the springs that may have become overgrown with grass and brush and weeds and stuff and uh, all just to prepare that table for his sheep in the summer. So we're in the care of Jesus who's been all over this territory before us and prepared the table for us in plain view of our enemies who would demoralize and destroy us if they could. Uh, you anoint my head with oil. The sheepmen say summertime is fly time. You know, uh, hordes of insects emerge with the coming of warm weather, you know, causing serious problems for the sheep. They, uh, like I said before, there's warble flies, bot flies. Here there's heel flies, nose or nasal flies, deer flies, black flies, mosquitoes, gnats, and other minute mm -hmm. winged parasites that come out during this time of year. So, you know, that can be real torturous for the sheep and especially the nasal fly. Uh, they buzz around the sheep's head and they try to lay their eggs in their nose, like in the damp mucus areas of their nose. And if they do, the eggs will hatch into small little worm-like larvae. And then they work their way up the nasal passages, passages into their head and burrow into the flesh and cause terrible irritation and inflammation. So to try to get relief, the sheep... You know, they'll go beating their heads against rocks and posts and, uh, I mean, you know, everything trying to get them out of there. And uh, they might end up beating their heads, beating themselves to death, trying to get relief from it. So when the flies hover around the flock, they can cause the sheep to be frantic with fear because they don't want to have to deal with all that. And they'll panic and, and go stomping their feet erratically and running all over the place and... Uh, and just going crazy trying to get away from all those flies to avoid that situation. And sometimes they might even run so much that they drop from exhaustion because they've just worn themselves out uh, from trying to get away from it. And, uh, and sometimes they won't even graze. They'll refuse to graze at all because they're just so stressed out and upset over all that stuff. So it can have a devastating effect on the whole flock. <laughs> and um, anyway, so the, uh, and sometimes even the, mamas, the ewes will stop feeding their lambs and everything. I mean, it's just, you know, all this craziness. And um, so some of them are injured, blinded, killed. I mean, all these things happen. So for the shepherd, at the very first sign of these flies among the flock, they apply an oil. You know, you notice my head with oil, uh, which is a homemade remedy made of linseed oil, sulfur, and tar which he would smear over the sheep's nose and head as a protection from those flies. And then once the soil, once the soil, once the oil had been applied to their head, it like made an immediate difference, you know, and, the, and they would start to be uh, settled down and everything and be peaceful again. So we all have irritations in our lives and uh, we need God's anointing of oil you know, on our minds to counteract all the stuff that goes on in there. The shepherd had to repeat the applications of oil. It wasn't a one and done thing. He had to continue to do it. Uh, and then I've got a 
blank. It says summertime is also scab time. So a scab, <laughs> scab is an irritating, it's a blank. <laughs> Scab is an irritating and highly contagious disease common among sheep that is caused by a microscopic parasite that grows in warm weather and spreads through a flock by direct contact. Sheep love to rub heads in an affectionate and friendly manner, and uh, scab is commonly found around the head, so when they're doing all their rubbing together and stuff well then they end up spreading it around and then everybody ends up with it yep. you know uh, the whole flock ends up you know eventually with it um, in the Old Testament when it says that the sacrificial lime, lambs lambs sacrificial <laughs> lambs should be without blemish uh, at that the uppermost thought of that was that the animal should be free from scab so I thought that was interesting. Oh, yeah, we're listening yeah. to Orion. Yeah. Well, we were, we were thinking about sacrificial lines. So <laughs> yeah. It'd be a lot easier. Yeah. <laughs> Highly Andro. Easier to take care of. Maybe you. Um, so, yeah. So, if they're the sacrificial lambs, basically had to be free from scab. Uh, scab is significant of contamination of sin and of eagle, eagle evil. The treatment for that was also an oil made of linseed oil, sulfur, and other chemicals that would control the diseases. <coughs> and then this is another blank. In biblical days, the remedy for both the flies and scab was made with an oil, or was an oil made with olive oil mixed with sulfur and spices, which that makes sense because olive oil was such a big thing. Probably still it's such a big thing. Uh, most of the contamination we receive by the world and by sin comes through our minds, our heads, which is where that they get all of their stuff. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me, follow me all the days of my life. So all the benefits enjoyed by a flock under a skilled and loving shepherd are shown with the good shepherd. You know, uh, we know that no matter what happens, no matter what the situation is, that the sheep are cared for by the good shepherd that he's going to make sure that all their needs are met he's going to protect them from all those things and um, and they're going to be contented they'll be able to lie down in, in peace and comfort and so and he keeps a watchful eye on them all the time and uh, <coughs> and so uh, Jesus is the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep uh, 1 John 3.16 says this is how we know what love is Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And then this is a blank. Sheep can, under mismanagement, be the most destructive livestock. Um, because, like, we were talking about being um, mismanaged. You know, the sheep, that the shepherd that didn't care about his sheep and all that, how that they would end up tearing up the land and uh, creating ruts and all that stuff. And... Um, that uh, and that they could damage and ruin the land beyond repair, so uh, they can be very destructive in that respect. But uh, on the other hand, when they have a shepherd that cares about them and loves them and makes sure that uh, they have everything they need, uh, they can be the most beneficial of all livestock. Um, it says their manure is the best balanced of any pro any produced by domestic stock and is of enormous benefit to the soil. Who would have thought? <laughs> uh, their habit of seeking the highest ground to rest on uh, helps uh, the fertility from the rich lowland to be uh, redeposited up higher on the higher less productive higher ground. They eat all sorts of weeds and undesirable plants, the non-poisonous ones, that might invade a field so they keep the weeds down and then um, in ancient literature sheep were referred to as those of the golden hooves simply because they were regarded and esteemed so highly for their beneficial effect on the land with a good shepherd oh, wow. when they had a good shepherd so this is what happens when goodness and mercy follow the flocks yeah so and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The sheep are so contented and so satisfied with their life, you know, under this good shepherd that always takes care of them, always sees that they're 
well fed, well watered, prevent, you know, protects them from the parasites, the predators, and all these things that, that it's life with this shepherd is just everything that it could ever want. You know, it couldn't imagine anything else. So, and the shepherd has this close relationship and, uh, and bond with the sheep and, uh, and he's so devoted to his sheep that the sheep never wants to part with him. And he wants to stay with him forever. So, uh, the, and the house is the family or household or flock of the good shepherd. The shepherd has brought them through all the storms, the hills, the valleys, protected them, like I said, from predators, parasites, poisonous plants, kept them fed and watered, protected from all the hazards of life, and has always taken care of them. And that's what our good shepherd does for us. So from the sheep standpoint, it's knowing that the shepherd is there. It's the constant awareness of his presence uh, nearby that automatically eliminates most of their difficulties and dangers. You know, just knowing that he's there gives them that peace and comfort, security. And then, uh, and the shepherd being there helps them to know that all their needs are going to be met. They're just like, okay, he's here. We know that we don't have anything to worry about. He's taking care of everything and he's going to provide us food to eat and uh, there'll be freedom from fear. You know, they don't have to fear anything. There will be treatment for flies and disease. And there will be a constant quietness and contentment. And uh, he will always take care of them, always be surrounding them with his presence. And that will continue through all eternity. He'll dwell in his house forever. And that's it. So, that's some, you know, it gives you some more perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, when you see how the, the sheep looks at it, <laughs> you know, um, and how important it is to have somebody that loves and cares about you. And, you know, Jesus is so good and so loving and so kind. And uh, we take for granted so much how, uh, how much he takes good care of us and how much he blesses us. And uh, somebody was commenting the other day about... Um, the I lost my train of thought because I was looking on there <laughs> but um, being in a near miss accident mm -hmm. type thing you know and I said how many times you know are we uh, we're late getting somewhere or we're stuck in traffic or we're this or that where that if we had been there when we were supposed to be there or whatever you know this you know the the deterrent or whatever might have been for our own protection and to take care of us. So, you know, we don't know how many times we might have been killed or might have been in an accident or something like that had we not been held up for whatever reason. You know, but anyway, do you, uh, do you all have anything to prayer requests? Do you have any prayer requests? My friend's nephew, Jonathan, is having surgery again. His, they found uh, issues with his intestines, and he's 24 years old. Wow. Okay. So, there's one. Okay. Anything for you? Anything for you? Passports. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, well, let's just pray. And um, we just thank you for the ones that are here tonight. God, I lift up Lauren's cousin. Friend. Friend. Sister. 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 What? Sister. Jonathan. Jonathan. Nephew, yes. Nephew. <laughs> <laughs> what is happening? That was over here. My sister's nephew, Jonathan. Okay, we lift up Jonathan to you <laughs> right now. And we just pray for healing in his body. We pray that uh, you will find whatever's going on with him, Lord, and that you will... See that he gets the help that he needs, Lord. And uh, we just pray for complete healing in his body. We just thank you, Lord, for that. And did you say something? No. Okay. And um, we just pray for those that are watching us tonight. And uh, we just pray for each one of you that uh, God will touch you, that he will bless you, that anything that you have need of, that uh, 
that he will meet those needs for you. We pray for breath, blessings <laughs> over each one of you, and we pray for Bryce that uh, for her state boards that uh, she would get all the studying in that she needs, and that she would pass those with flying colors. And we just uh, we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so thankful that y'all joined us here tonight, and that y'all joined us here tonight, and. Uh, hopefully, we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. It was such a long drive for you. I was a little afraid.